Good morning, good morning, good morning. Day one, day one. On off here, on also. Todoro number. Wherever you may be today, underneath the sound of my voice, may nothing but goodness follow you. I am so grateful. My daughter visited uh, for the holidays and she called this morning to say that uh, from Florida and uh, she made it home safely, which is what we always want. So thank you, Chineke, for that. Uh, we're still in the month of uh, Iguji. This is the month that we are supposed to plant, prepare to plant uh, for whatever it is we want for our future, whatever we want from hands. You know, it's never too late to start. Uh, what you didn't plan yesterday, get ready to plant it this week, this month, this year, and the upcoming year. It's all good. All is good. All is well with all of us. Chineke is in the mix. Thank you all for joining us, wherever you're joining us from. Uh, YouTube, Facebook, wherever you are. Thank you for being a part of our experience, a part of our joy today, because, you know, you are one of the lucky few. Many are not walking around today, and here we are. I think that is a good reason to celebrate, don't you? Um, I'm your host, Dr. Waonyo Haosimere, and it is my honor again to welcome you to Team Walking Amongst the Living. What a privilege, what a privilege. May every way of your life be light and all your acts be crowned with good. And may the world prosper by everything we say today from our ministry. Thank you, thank you all for being here. I, I'm just thanking Chineke that uh, 
I'm here uh, and that you're here. I have, uh, I sprained my knee. I'm not sure how I did that. You know, it's terrible to, to have an injury, but you can't explain it. And I'm supposed to be traveling very soon. So it is my hope that Chineke will hear my prayers and yours included. Hopefully you pray for me <laughs> so that these knees will heal because I certainly don't want to be waddling through anywhere. So let me start today by encouraging all of you to live by your faith. We're all being tested, being tried, everything you can think about. Even nature is trying us with all the flooding, with all the uh, uh, fires everywhere, so many things, earthquakes, you name it. Nature is testing us that we have to walk in our faith that all will be well. How many times do we say that we will walk in our faith, but we don't do it? For the most part, when everything is going well, that's when we recognize our faith. That's when we are in full force, faith. We have faith. But once things don't quite go our way, we lose faith. It's important for us to lose, to keep our faith in spite of all these things that are going on. And so when, you know, when we talk about faith, what is faith? Faith is the expectancy of things we can't see. Having faith that something we aspire to or something we want in our lives will become a reality. It is imagination. See, imagination and faith go hand in hand. If you can conceive it, you can achieve it. Use your imagination to lose your uh, to 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 live your faith, whatever it is that you want. See it before it even ha it even happens. Once you visualize it, once you visualize what the results will be, then accept that it has happened already. So for me today, I accept my faith is that my, my knee will heal. I'm imagining myself walking without any contraption in hand. That is my faith. It's important to have that faith. And most importantly, to work towards your faith. Because if you don't work towards it, it will die. So take a moment today. Check in with the creator, Chineke. Get the direction you need to do all that you have to do. There's so much to do. To work towards where you want to be. Where you are right now is not permanent. Believe that you can get out of it, work to get out of it, and voila, know that Chineke can only do for you what she can do through you, and Ike can keep in you. Mm, hear what I just said. Know that Chineke can only do for you what can be done through you and can be kept in you. Once you understand that, just know that all is in divine order. When you plant the seed of faith, knowing it's going to happen, you just have to sit back and wait to reap the fruit of your efforts. Stop spending time worrying what it happen because everything that happens to you as you continue to move towards your good is really all a part of the journey, even the bad aspect of life is all part. All those experiences has some good in its fabric. Affirm it and live by your faith. Know that all is well. Know that all is well. I want to welcome you to this very special episode where we are going to be talking about our elders. And to help me to do so today is uh, none other than Dibia Yudi Onyoha. Dibiakawo. Yeah, guys, here to all. Uh, may every way of our lives be light. May our acts be crowned with good. And may we all be better people from this segment today. And of so all, it is. And so it is. Ise. 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 Not and, and, and don't, don't worry about the, 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 the knee. It's going to be all right. Uh, it's gonna happen. I have faith. I know, the pain is great sometimes, you know, but Mind over matter goes a long yes. way too, uh, yes. because mind over matter means determination. And yes. once you're determined to overcome something, more than likely you'll overcome it as long as there's a way to overcome it. Mm -hmm. Now, if there's no way to overcome it, then it's a big problem, right? You start wishing for a miracle, yeah. you know, some divine intervention. But yeah. 
Earthly intervention combined with divine intervention simply means that you are healed. So keep the faith. You're going to be all right. Yes, yes, yes. And, of course, I want to add to the stream, Didia Chiedozie, how are you? I know, meow. I'm fine. Didia, you know, you know, you know, I know, I know, I know, I yeah, yeah, don't they will, you know, they will, they will want to want to add my voice to the healing, uh, the healing group. Yes. Uh, yeah, give your give your charge has just uh, talked about it all. Yeah, yeah, we explore both ends. That's how our uh, our approach is, uh, has always been. We yes. use both the earthly and the, the divine. Uh, we do what humans can do, and then we ask for divine intervention. You so. Say ensure yes, that yes. Uh, ensure that you you go through your medical routine and to know exactly what is wrong then the other to that is positive energy and yes and, yes. Okay. Yeah. and yes. so it is welcome welcome hey and now i want to add the queen herself <laughs> dr simona money how are you Oh, very well. It's so good to see all of you. And Welcome. I Welcome. thank you for, for having me again. No. And I'd like to thank no, Gina no. K and the ancestors. And I'm always I'm already thanking the ancestors for your healing. Yes. Your excellency. Yes. So I'm already thanking the ancestors for that because I'm confident yes. that you will be healed. So yes. You know, that is what I'm confident that there will be a very speedy recovery he and said, that they will heal you. He he said, said, between Chinike and the ancestors, you will receive your healing now. I, he I, I accept it. I believe it. And here we go. I'm ready to run a race now. Yeah. <laughs> yes. All in, mind, all in the mind. Absolutely. Hey, today we are going to discuss the importance of honoring our elders and taking care of them. This is a practice that, uh, unfortunately, slowly but surely, we in African communities are starting to lose. But it's so critical and essential that we take care of our elderly because of several reasons. You know, the elders have two significant roles in traditional African cultures, south of the Sahara, and quite frankly, all over the world, if we pay attention to what significance they have in our lives. First, we have to respect age for the elderly as a construct of being an African. We have to have it in our minds. If you're an African, you respect the elderly. I don't care who you are, actually. If you're, if you're, if, if you're a human being and there are elders in your society, in your community, you respect them. It should be an ideal. It should be a social ideal. Okay, in, in, in Igbo land, for instance, in my village, uh, we, people are organized in uh, age groups. We have the age group, even the age group system of governance. You know, the significance of, 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 of aging is so significant that people are actually organized by groups. And membership in such groups helps to define the person's sense of identity and place in the community. The people who are significant in community are not just the younger ones, as some societies make it seem. You know, these are weakened social values now in Africa in particular. And I'm focusing in, in Africa and uh, in African-American communities, you know, or wherever African people are on the uh, face of this earth. This is our tradition. It is something that we must do. It is a powerful it's, it's powerful when we listen to the elders and see what they have to give, you know, what they have to offer. There's so much that they have to offer, you know, that sometimes I just, I just go to a, a place of uh, a home for the elderly just to sit and talk to them. You know, the wise uh, old men and wise women, you know, they are the eyes of Chineke, the eyes of God. Most societies see them as that. Most African societies see them as the eyes of God. You know, what they see, the young have not seen yet. What they, have, what they see while sitting down, a child can never experience until they get to a certain level. 
They can see the tallest mountains and tell us about it figuratively. They have so much wisdom. But unfortunately, we don't take those wisdom anymore. The wisdom that we look to are the ones in the books or the wisdom on television. Uh, in this, uh, these days, it's uh, TikTok, YouTube, whatever. And then the elders are just pretty much ignored. I have a question for each one of you before I play a video of which I want us to talk a little bit about what each elder is saying in that video. But Yudi, I believe that the greatest obligation that the elders have is to pass their knowledge uh, of the world, their wisdom to the next generation. They are the foundation. But why are we not respecting them anymore? What do you think is contributing to the neglect that the elders are facing now? I think a lot has to do with, uh, I could be wrong, but this is just my perception of it because it's not really something that I spend a whole lot of time on, you know, because uh, to me, it's, it's, it's obvious that the transmission of uh, uh, foreign religion and culture, right? The way it's presented to us has kind of uh, minimized the importance of uh, the elder in our communities. Uh, elder, elder is part of our culture, it's part of our religion, it's part of our spiritual belief system. It is what we do. Elders are transmissions of the culture. They are guidance of the secrets of life, okay? They mm -hmm. are the wise ones, they're the cheers. And mm -hmm. uh, normally, if you want to prevent uh, conflict in a community, or you want to pre uh, 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 preserve peace within a community, you normally will consult with the elders and they broker the peace in the family or between, you know, uh, uh, two communities. And one thing we have to also understand that is that the idea or the importance of elders in a community is just not an African thing, right? You know, most world cultures, you know, have the same reverence for elders. Uh, in the Mayan culture, it's a very important uh, uh, place to be in life. They serve the same roles. In Confucianism, for example, is the same thing. Confucius himself, you know, uh, spent a lot of time talking about the importance of listening to the elders. You know, they provide a uh, 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 blueprint, right, for the next generation. They, they, they understand and tell the story of how the community began and how the community got to where it is now and where the community is going. The so why are we? Uh, the question I'm asking is, why are we in Africa not respecting our elders like we used to? That's why? I, I just answered it the first time. Foreign religion. If it was not for the introduction of Christianism in, in, in Africa, what do you think will be happening right now? Then, of course, technology also seems to cloud our brain in terms of the idea that some of the things that were shorted in mysticism can be explained scientifically. But personally speaking, it is the introduction of foreign religion and minimizing the importance of the elder system, which is part of our spiritual culture. That is really the truth about it. There's no other way to decipher or look at it other than the fact that because of the introduction of foreign religion, those things are not important anymore. Remember, in Imporo, to go through, to become an adult, you have to go through rites of passage. Mm -hmm. That was intrinsic on, in, on every level, man or woman, there's a rites of passage. And the rites of passage and the education that you get going to those rites of passage also includes the importance of or the influence of elders. Most of the rites of passage you go through, the elders, the one that instituted and conducted. Mm -hmm. And you learn from the elders. The elders were part of your educational system, culturally speaking. Now, go to Nigeria now. How many people go through rites of passage? They don't they even see it as a taboo. It doesn't even happen. It's a taboo now. It's a bad thing. It's a witchcraft. It's a whatever it is they want to call it, whatever. So let nobody tell you any different. The reason why the respect is not the way it used to be before colonization is because of the introduction of foreign religion. It changed the educational system. So those mm -hmm. things that were important in educating young folks, in yes. grounding you in your societal responsibilities, was replaced by class, class, classroom lecture. Yes. And that's it. There's no other reason. Yeah. 
Nobody can tell you anything else other than that. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, that's a very, very important. Uh, if we understand the role that uh, foreign religions have played. You know, I'm, I always want to let people know, I have no problems with people's religions. We don't, cheese don't, we don't have any problems with that. The only thing that we want to stress is about how our own religious practices or spiritual practices actually shaped, were foundational for how we conducted ourselves. And because just as Divya Yudi has said, other things have been introduced and we abandon. There's nothing wrong with, you know, taking new information, learning from it, take what you will and abandon what you can't, what you can't use. But you don't throw the baby out of the dirty bath water. And that's what we have done. And that's what we are doing. And so those relevant uh, educational systems or processes incorporated in, in our traditional educational system, which are our elders, now those are now being phased out and much, of course, to the detriment of our people. Now, the question, next question I have is for Dr. Monet. You know, there, you, you, you were born here in America, and uh, in America, to some degree, uh, elders continue to be highly respected members of society. You know, uh, there are so many uh, opportunities uh, rev, uh, uh, given to elders, uh, deference to elders, you know, some things you, you, you buy cheaper because you're an elder. So we understand that. But what is very, very troubling is when elders are in homes away from their families. Why I, I think to me, that's a form of disrespect. I mean, there, there are certain situations where a person has to leave home, maybe because the family can't afford it or whatever. But they are, the way they are placed in some of these homes and totally ignored uh, is just absolutely horrific. What are your thoughts on that, Dr. Moni? My thoughts on that is the same as what's going on in Africa. I grew up learning to respect my elders. And I, I did grow up Christian, but one of the things in, in the Bible, it says that you have to honor your elders, you have to respect your elders. So that was ingrained in me. And I, um, fortunately, thank Trina K, most of my elders lived to their own old age. So I grew up with my great grandmother going over there every day and she lived with my great aunts. And there was high levels of respect for them. If you disrespected or tried to disrespect the elders in my family, there was a real issue. I mean, you would get punished by several people in the family. That was just not called for in my um, family. And then our elders, we always um, just like my grandfather that passed, you know, the family takes care of the elders. They're not going to home unless it's a, a very extreme situation. My grandmother um, on my father's side. Dr. Money, Dr. Money, let me stop you for a moment. We're having a little difficulty with your uh, audio. It's static and it's going in and out. So I'm going to take you out, try and figure that out, okay. and I'll bring you back to, to finish. Okay. Okay, now I want to go to uh, uh, Divya Achille Dozier. Um, I want to share this with you. You're, I'm sure you're not aware of it, but uh, uh, the Lieutenant Governor, Dan Patrick for Texas, said that, and he made this uh, on, uh, on television so everybody can hear. He says that um, the elders who are at risk of becoming ill, seriously ill, or dying from COVID virus or anything else, should sacrifice themselves for the common economic good so that they should not bother to heal. They should just go on and die off. What are your thoughts about that kind of sentiment? Well, that is exactly uh, upon the premise of what uh, Dibel Charger, Ude Mizwe said. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a manifestation of the culture of the, culture of the nuclear family. Yeah. The, mon the monoculture and the emphasis on technology. And that's exactly uh, the result of destroying the extended family system. Mm -hmm. Because when you destroy the extended family system, which is built on the structure of nature itself, because if you look at nature, everything is connected to everything. There's interconnection. All waters meet on the ground. And even on, on the surface, if water seems 
which be more than earth beneath the waters the earth is holding everything together so the earth is even stretching more than the waters mm -hmm. the trees their roots are interconnected so and all energy uh, they say the uh, uh, quantity of energy supply equals the quantity received by every atom in the universe every cell in the body uh whether of human or animals or trees now this is what the ancients because all ancient societies build what you call uh an extent everything was extended for them family was extended guild system professional system was extended age group system was extended everything connected everything so that there were checks and balances now uh, like the Indians who say, and like it has become a common uh, uh, saying, if you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, you go together. And so the Western culture wanted to go fast, so they destroyed that extended system, and they went nuclear. Then going nuclear now encourages extreme individualism, and then they ended up coming to the age of capitalism, and in capitalism, it tries on liberalism, liberalism to new liberalism, and now to the age of knowledge economy, which they call globalization. So at each stage, you're getting more emphasis on what they call individual autonomy, self-sovereignty. And yes. the individual has been made the foundation of society. And so uh, because there's no extended system, the agent cannot be taken care of by the family. It has to be taken care of by the government. It will go mm -hmm. to a time when diminishing return will set in, and then it seems in capitalism, society is measured in terms of quantum of wealth, of waste. And so it will get to a time when age will be seen as detrimental, taking care of the agent will be seen to be detrimental to the society especially with uh, science and technology and advanced medicine if the agent become more in number than the productive age they begin to see the agent as eating deep into the economy mm -hmm. and so and because economy society is measured in terms of material essence economy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so the age you are, they we will find a way of edging out the age yes but if the focus of society is human development, and if the extended family system is there, there will be checks and balances, and you just discover that technology will be put to such service, because you, you would not expect this in a place like Saudi Arabia or in a place uh, like Israel, where mm. they still keep their travel, or like a place like Dubai, the Arab nation, India, uh, those traditional places where they still keep their culture intact. Mm -hmm. You discover that, uh, for instance, in Dubai, all that all that we see may, is not touching down on the culture of the people. It just yes. built a place where people can come and live and uh, they get their money, then they take care of their people, their culture is still intact. And so, yeah. uh, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, the West has always a way of uh, saying that it is the most uh, uh, evolved society and has mm -hmm. a way of throwing this weight around. Uh, I hope this particular saying of the governor of Texas does not become, as usual, a European, uh, Western, Occidental model for the rest of the world. Yeah, well, uh, thank, uh, I think uh, people realized how asinine that was because that just absolutely does not make sense. We all have elderly people in our communities, you know, how in our families, how in the world would we want to get rid of, uh, you know. And then uh, they, they even talked about the fact that uh, the elders are so inconsequential that we, we need to get rid of uh, programming that supports them, such as Social Security. You know, Social Security, when, when you're old and you can't work and you're in your 90s, how in the world are you supposed to support yourself? Like it falls on the young family trying to raise children. So people who think like that, I just don't I just don't understand. Thank you very much for your input. Now I want to go back to Dr. Monet. Uh, hopefully your your audio is better so you can continue your thoughts. Yes. Um, could you guys hear me now? Yes. Much okay. better. Yeah. So what I was saying is, you know, for me, when I grew up, even um, as soon as, you know, 
as early as when I grew up, you know, there was a respect for your elders, which we've gotten away from. You know, I grew up, fortunately, my family has pretty longevity. So I knew my, my grandmother on both sides, my great grandmothers on both sides. And we, we, the family had respect for our elders. And even now, um, my grandfather just transcended, but in that he died in his, he transcended in his, his own bed at his house because the family came and took care of him. We did not put him in a home. He did hospice at his own home. My grandmother has dementia and everyone is taking turns taking care of her because we are not going to put her in a home. We don't believe in that in our family. And I wish more families um, stood on that. And for me, I, I respect my elders when my great grandmother was dying or, or transcending. I don't like using dying. When she was transcending, I remember I was a little girl and seeing all of the family taking turns, including me. I was going over there because I went over there. We lived really close by every day and until until she transcended. And I remember us taking care and I learned from my elders how, you know, the value in taking care of, of my elders and the importance of taking care of my elders. But so many people have gotten away from that. They just throw their parents in a home and that is it. That's and it. I know I had a, um, you know, our society, I think it's, you know, our, our society here has made, has taken, a, you know, has, has gone away from the respect of elders, period. When I work for, I work for the state of Michigan and providing food assistance, medical assistance, and things like that. So for me, in my opinion, every elder should have gotten the full amount of food assistance available out there because they've lived their life and many of them has worked and contributed to these society all of these years but they would sometimes they wouldn't even qualify or they'll give them $16 a month. I would just, it would just hurt me so bad, you know, only being able because of the government policy, only being able to give these elders $16 a month or nothing at all. And they're sitting here with their bills saying, when I pay everything, I have nothing for food mm. and mm. I have to go to the soup kitchen in order yes. to get food. Our yes. elders should not be living this way. Yes. And further, if our elders cannot afford food, our the family should be coming, coming and providing for that elder or taking them into their home. But that's something that we, a mindset that most people do not have now. And yes. the family has broken. I know with the African American community during the crack epidemic and all of that where the family was torn apart and broken up that i think had a very big impact on the family and our our respect for elders i think it's at that pivotal point i think that you know caused a disruption where you know we lost a lot of our values just simple yeah. values in yeah. this community i'm in an arabic community and we just had Thanksgiving. Um, we invited some of our Lebanese friends over. And they were saying how no one is in, none of their elders are in, you know, uh, those homes. They none of them. them. They take them in. I see them, my neighbor across the street, and we're thinking that's his home, and the kids are living with him. But no, it's the other way around. But they respect him so much that they allow their elders to take over and run the household. Mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah. you know, it appears that that's their house and the kids are coming over with them. But really and truly, that's the kids house and they're taking in their parents in their older age, you know, and they have enough respect to allow them to feel comfortable in that home. That's right. And so we we need to get back to that because the elders are so important they're so important to the children to the grandchildren yes. yes because i know for me i learned so much from my grandparents you yes. know i learned a lot of value i i gained a lot of value and i listened to my grandparents more than my parents i valued yes. what they had to offer to me because they kind of took me under their wing yeah 
you know, so you we know have what? to get back to that. We need to, uh, uh, Akachi Azubike wrote something I think I just want to share quickly. Western culture sees the elders as useless eaters historically. In classic Europe, they would be, they would drop their elders off to the edge of the city to die. That's true. I know that I read that. Wow. Uh, hence, the nursing home culture of the West is normalized. You know, it's a place to put them away, you know, because they, they get in the way. And even sometimes when a child, you know, is angry with the grandparents, you know, they, they, they decide, well, you know, hey, I, I don't want I don't even want my children to have anything to do with you, which is wrong. You know, those yeah. children need the, what the uh, elders, their grandparents have to offer. I want to play this video. And this video is uh, it's just it's just a collection of uh, wise words from some of the great Africans. And I'm going to play to the end. It's not long at all. And then I want to take each one of them and have us discuss what they are trying to say to us. OK, so here we go. Okay, uh, what I want to do now is I'm going to take it to where uh, we have a, a, the, the wisdom of an ancestor. And all these people, of course, are no longer with us. So I'm going to ask you your thoughts. Uh, Yudi, what is our hind trying to Can you hear me? I can't hear you, Yudi. He has his um all right i had the i had muted okay. myself while the whole thing was going so i could minimize the uh, noise in the background from me to chineke there is no distance the god you seek is in you in Uporo, we have a saying madubuchi bear you are like chineke to your fellow human being chineke's blessings come through somebody else sometimes that blessings comes through you the chineke you seek dwells inside of you. So do unto others as you would like chineke to do unto you. We could pray all we want to, but what's important is our relationship with ourselves, relationship with our neighbors, relationship with our environment. We have to understand that the environment that we live in is divine here. There's no city up in the sky somewhere or up in the clouds. There's no point looking up for blessings. Look in the mirror, look at your neighbor, do the right spiritual things to allow you to perhaps, at least, maybe not decipher the journey towards the mystery of Chineke. Mm -hmm. Because the mystery of Chineke is your spirit. It is how you conduct yourself. It is how you see your neighbor. It is how you uh, 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 appreciate the diversity in this world because this diversity is divine. So don't look down on anybody else. 
Consider yes. your neighbor the same person that can help you out in your time of need when you have prayed for Chineke's blessings. It might be your neighbor. Yes. Sometimes your own blessing has to do with your own action. So look inward. Look at in your uh, you know uh, 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 look at your environment how you relate to it. Look at your neighbor. It is when you understand this cosmic mixture mm -hmm. that you grow closer to God that yes. perhaps your prayers are more apt to be answered. I you see. can't look anywhere else other than inside of you because the, right. the God you seek is here. You, you are it. That's it. When God's image spiritually, we're not talking about physical resemblance. Yes. We're talking about spiritual makeup. The God yes. you seek is in you and so it is thank you so did your chair does here your thoughts on what i is saying yeah you see the thing about chinik is that chupu bumo is spirit energy yeah. and this is more in, in our belief system has primacy over all things material because all mm -hmm. material things are uh, can, we can say material things are could, uh, congealed spirits. That's why mm -hmm. you can heat stone to release energy. You can heat water to release steam and, and so on and so forth. And so everything, by the principles of vitalism and pantheism, everything that proceeded from Chineke has the spirit of Chineke in it. In it. And including the whole of the universe and so chineke is what i'm in and it's in, in me above me below me in front of me behind me at the right at the left all over around me and i'm inside it and since i am ifenta that is the little chi mm -hmm. i am just part of that spark in actual mm -hmm. fact there's only one spirit the universal consciousness just like rain comes from one source and when it drops, it scatters. That's the way yeah. it is. And then when yeah. it gets, the, 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 the rain drops, when it gets to the ground, it mix. And so all of us are supposed to be interconnected. And that is yes. why we have the theory of interpenetrability of life forces. All yes. forces interpenetrate, interconnect. Everything is extended. Mm -hmm. And so, it is not possible for you to become uh, low or high without the participation of fellow human beings and other cosmic forces. Yes. And that's yes. why in African spirituality, in African spirituality, we have so many dimensions, the linear dimension that represent women who hold things together. So when one holds things together, we give it to the women. You have the vertical. Uh, uh, the vertical dimension, which represents imposition of order, and that male symbolizes that. And so when mm -hmm. we cross the male and the female, we have the cross. Then we mm -hmm. have a cyclical dimension that says everything is in everything. Nothing is out of this place, just like mm -hmm. your child has said. Then mm -hmm. we have the hierarchical dimension by which higher forces affect lower forces and bound together by the cyclical dimension such that every hierarchy in the human realm from elder to the young to the infant are cyclically connected and then there is no particular unit that does not have its function and so the aged yes pass on to the spirit world the spirit world will take to the future the future will come back to the present and this interconnection defines what Chineke is for us and what relationship should be for us, yes. which is why we must go back to our spirituality because that is what colonization yes. came to destroy. And one thing they keep telling yes. us, they tell us we are tribes and then they try to tell us we should be detribalized. Detribalized, getting detribalized is a way of abandoning your spirituality, abandoning your ethnicity. Yes. Because once you abandon your mm. ethnicity, then you do not have a foundation to stand. You must proceed yes. from a standpoint 
True. Because the universe is there. That's right. You must define your standpoint. Your standpoint yes. is your ethnicity that defines your spirituality. And that is what colonization came to destroy and then gave us this conglomeration of colonial creature states, Nigeria, Ghana, and so on and so forth. Yes. And then boxed yes. us in so that we will for all we will forever be contesting for superiority. And so yes. if yes. we want to solve this problem and solve it permanently, that's why I suggested there's just we should copy what they have done. Britain, for instance, even though England is, is a, having the upper hand, but every ethnic group that makes up Britain has a semi-autonomy. You go to Switzerland, the same thing. Mm -hmm. You go to Canada, the French axis control its affair, the English axis controls its affair. That is the simple thing we should do. After we got independence, what we should do is we create our access into a spirituality. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that, was, that didn't happen. And that's part of not yeah. respecting the elders because uh yes. because the politicians were trained by the whites unlike asia we are the uh, deliberators mm. like mao and, and uh, uh the uh, Lin, uh Linkwa, uh the, the man in singapore they grew in their mystery system so they kept the spirituality intact while here we were doing mixing and the mixing was that we bring West, we bring Western theories that are built on the theories of monism, individualism, and want to use it to organize the culture of togetherness. That's how we got to this point. And so, yes, KOK Onyoha is simply telling us go back to your spirituality. And like I say again, That's to right. summarize, we are in the district today in Nigeria, and none of the politicians so far is talking about our problem. They are all talking about good roads, making uh, some place to become yeah. the Dubai of Africa, making yes. some place to become the Singapore yeah. of Africa. Right no one is talking about econometrics and economics and production and so on. Nobody is talking about identity. And if yes. we do not get that issue of identity correct in this century, after this century, any black yep. person living will be simply a slave. Yes. True, true. Thank you. True, true. true, true. Awesome. Good awesome. Good uh, awesome. Yeah. Dr. Monet, your thoughts. Your thoughts on that, yes. Dr. Monet. Definitely. There is no distance between Chinake and myself or anyone else for that matter. I know I work with the work that I do, and um, you know, I'm a Reiki master and I do spiritual work and intuitive. And there is no distance. My distance work is just as good as the work that is done in person. People get results in a distance, just like they get results right there. Chena K reaches people wherever they're at. And Chena K is in everything. But we have to be able to identify Chena K. I know I, I talk to a lot of people and they're like, you know, with from the West, there and have Western only know the Western um, forms of, of religion, more so religion, the spirituality. And a lot of times they express to me, I can't relate to that. I can't relate to the way that um, they, you know, they're, they've learned to connect with Chinake or what they would say with mm -hmm. God or the universe. They can't relate to that because they're not realizing that Chena K is everywhere. Chena K is inside of them. Maybe you should be trying to connect with the divine inside of you, with Chena K inside of you. And so we have to yes. realize that Chena K is everywhere. Chena K is everywhere. in all of us. And mm -hmm. we can, if we have prayers, like you said, we a lot of times are answering other people's prayers. Mm -hmm. we're doing that yep. not to say you know a lot of times the blessings come through us you may receive mm -hmm. a check in the mail you may have been praying for for money and you receive a check in the mail but that check a lot of times came from somewhere from yes. someone writing that check you know yeah, so right. it's the divine in us it's the china k in us and we're yes. all connected i agree with yes. uncle we're all connected Yes. Yes. So 
Chena yeah. K through Chena K. We have to understand not through the ego or through, mm -hmm. you know, who we think we are, the illusion of who we are, but through Chena mm -hmm. K, we're all connected. That's right. And we're perfect right. through Chena K. Yeah. You know, thank you so much. You know, I, I, I witnessed where human beings were treated, particularly when he was in South Africa. And he saw how the African black, uh, uh, black South Africans were being treated as inferior to the whites, and uh, that that just really got to him because his impression about all of us before he experienced racism, he, his impression was that we were all together. Particularly at the time that uh, the Christianity in Nigeria was trying to promote the fact that you know love your neighbor as you love yourself and. Uh, uh, God created all of us. We're all chinic, uh, we're all uh, the children of God and all that sort of thing. But then when he goes went to South Africa and saw that, he realized that, that the African people themselves were embracing the notion that they were less than, you know, the people who had God were the of uh, the whites uh, and the Indians and all those people. They they knew God, they 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 were closer to God, and so we have to aspire to be like them. So we have to embrace and accept our subjugation to, you know, inferiority, you know. So for him, part of his crusade was to let people understand that you are as honorable, as good as everybody else, because right where you are, God is. Yes. Chinik is right in you. You're, 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 you're a reflection of the Most High. And if you believe, if you truly b believe in, in Chineke, then you should not accept that you're less than because then to accept that means that Chineke is less than. So I really, really applaud. Uh, I appreciated that. And as a matter of fact, when we were growing up, we were taught to say that, right? On t shirts and everything, we have that, you know, right where you are, God is, you know, right where you are, Chineke is. And that became our modus operandi. Uh, now, the next one I want to us to discuss is, uh, let's see. Uh, and that's the good thing about these elders, you know, some of them, some of their words of wisdom are just ignored, like it's nothing. You know what I'm saying? You know, mm -hmm. and we're looking for what uh, some of these no count <laughs> celebrities are saying, you know, and we ignore what our elders are, to uh, are talking about. I'm trying to get to. What this one is saying, there is a difference between being in a position of power and being in a position of responsibility. Elders in traditional communities do not take power. They take responsibility and empower others. You do your thoughts. Like we had uh, discussed in the beginning, you know, elders are the transmitters of the culture. And it is being custodians of the culture and having this transmission ability to transmit and also interpret history. That's what empowers the next generation. You have to know where you've been to know where you're going. Whatever you experience today was built on the backs of those that came before you. Yes. That is serious power. Mm -hmm. That is empowering the future generations because they're standing on your back. You're suffering. Yes. You are the one that figured it out for them. Mm -hmm. The concept of everything that is known to man is based on those that came before the present generation. That's right. Regardless of how far back you go, even some of the so-called rights that we enjoy after slavery was ended, the struggle was built on somebody's back. The independence that we achieved in Africa and got rid of at least physical colonization by the Portuguese, by the French, and by the British. That struggle was built on the backs of the Ahanis, the Nandiazikiways, the Jomo yes. Kenyatas, the Robert Mugabe's, the, 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 the Patrice Lumumba's, and the, the Kwame Nkrumah's, so on and so forth. The elders empower the next generation. That's true. They don't vie for power. Mm -hmm. Elders don't 
at this point in their lives when they should be disseminating the information, sit there struggling for power. By the time you become a, an elder, you really don't have the energy anymore. You are accomplished. Your children are gone, grown. You, you are retired. You probably have accumulated enough, uh, 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 maybe not wealth, but enough resources to finance your, you know, the remaining of your years. You know, in Africa, for example, uh, in Umburu, okay, let me just be specific to my own uh, village. Once you turn 18 or once you have gone through the seven years of rites of passage, you are married off to a predetermined lady that was chosen for you. You're given land to farm. You're given everything that you need to build a life for yourself and your family. So you're never destitute through your life till your children are grown, till you become an elder. You are a self-made person. You don't need anything from anybody. And through your tutelage, during your rites of passage, you learn the responsibility of bequeathing your knowledge to the next generation, because that's how the society yes. was built. It was built on the backs of the knowledge, the elders, those that came before. You know, a baby can't give birth to a baby. Mm -mm. I had, when guy, you know, it's not that bang, here's a baby, baby boy, baby girl, there you go. No, came from somebody. Somebody prepared the way. So what this is really saying is that the wisdom and knowledge, the transmission of culture, being guardians of the secrets of life, being the wise ones that are consulted to prevent conflict or to preserve peace, having all these things as part of your accolade as an elder is what empowers the next generation. And so it is. Excellent. Yes. Wonderful. Dr. Chia, uh, uh, Chia, your thoughts? Yeah, my thoughts, I will take it in three levels. Uh, number one, who is an elder? Uh, we have to clarify that because not everybody that was aged was an elder in our society, in traditional society. I mean, but we made this difference between Ichi and uh, uh, Okinyapari. That's, and in Yoruba, they talk about Agba and Agbalaba. Agbalaba is Okinyapari. And um, the Yoruba even have a saying that uh, you see an uh, one with extreme white hair and you assume he's an elder, have you surveyed or investigated to uh, find out if he practiced madness to become an elder? Uh, this is necessary because today in Africa, the so-called elders, quote and unquote, seem not to know their roles anymore. Mm -hmm. They do not know that their role is to point the way and guide and guard the future. Mm -hmm. They seem to have forgotten that. They think that their role is to be in the front and suppress the youth. Yes. And mm -hmm. that is happening right now in Nigeria because yes, uh, before the political situation campaign got to the level it is now, there were three categories. Uh, the whole of uh, uh, presidential candidates were classified into three. One, mm -hmm. they classified the first set as ancestors, that's uh, uh, bat and articulates. All mm -hmm. right. Then uh, those who want to take the thing by force are uh, Wiki and the Rotimi Amechi. And then those who are meek about it, uh, Obi and um, Oshibajo. Now, if you look at it, the likes of uh, 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 Bart and Articulate are supposed to be veterans by now, talking about how talking about how Nigeria should move forward, guiding and guarding it jealously, and educating and directing the youth how to do it well. But they feel nobody can do it better other than them. Mm -hmm. And in that situation, they become Okenya Pari. Abalag, Abaya, mm -hmm. not Abalaga, not Iche. Yeah. And so, now the second thing I want us to do is to look at our world view. 
Our worldview is cyclical. And because it is cyclical, heaven is not out and out there. Heaven is within. And so ancestors do not go to heaven to rest. Ancestors go to heaven to look down on those on earth, guide and guard and direct them such that if there are problems, the invasion, they intervene. Mm -hmm. They can incarnate as a wonderful child with great wisdom or powerful uh, uh, war uh, 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 principles and power. You know, so ancestors, our heaven is not a place where people go and sit and relax and be singing Hosanna, Hosanna forever. <laughs> it is where ancestors go and stay and still watch over those on earth. And that is the yes. role of the elders because the elders are looking for the day they will join that group that are over, overlooking, overseeing, seeing what happens here. And so for that, they do know it's a heavy responsibility to be an elder. You have you yes. represent the, sim, the symbol of authority, the symbol of coordination, the symbol of respect, the symbol of culture, not to forget the fact that in Africa, where we had oral tradition, elders represent the books that we read. They represent our libraries. And so we always go to them. We always went to them for uh, storytelling, to find out things, how to move forward, because it is only when you know your past and that you can begin to move in the right direction towards the future. Now, yes. uh, the, the, structure, the structure that we have now is mixing everything together. And so people seem not to know their roles anymore. And uh, because we are all hustling and materialism has been put in the front, uh, we forget what should be our roles. The eighth great system has been decapitated. We are running from the villages. Weddings are conducted and marriages are conducted in the city. Even the elders yes. encourage their people not to come home because home is not safe. And then the uh, hoodlums have taken over the villages. They beat the elders. They slap the elders. They, uh, they, they do a lot of things. So things are upside down. Uh, I do not know exactly how we are going to put this right. That's mm. the, the, my, my fear. I think we should look into that as we go on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Dr. Monet, what are your thoughts? My thoughts is, a, my thoughts is and what comes to mind is a wise elder that takes the responsibility to spread the um, wisdom to the community um, will create a powerful, powerful nation. I mean, you know, we have to have our elders. We have to, I know in my family, I can see the matriarchs or what we call matriarchs or patriarchs in the family, the elders that are able to lead everyone, that everyone goes to for the wisdom my father is one of those. He's one of the people that everyone goes to for wisdom to find out if they have any, any questions about anything. They follow his lead. And so that is so important. A lot of times when the matriarch or the patriarch is taken, is, you know, transcends or, um, you know, maybe taken away or something happens where they're not in that position anymore, then the family does not know what to do. But we, you know, as matriarchs and patriarchs and elders, they, they one thing that must happen is that we must train the other generation when we see that leadership and um, other people in the family and things like that, of you know, them being able to step up to the plate. You know, but that is so important. I've seen even with my um, great grandmother's seat on my father's side, when she was the matriarch of the family. So everyone went to her. And when she passed, it it really um, caused division in the family. It caused a lot of things that happened. And people didn't know what to do because they were used to going to her, you know, with the wisdom, gaining the wisdom that she had for them. But 
that is so important. I've seen it in my own family. And I know that the wisdom of the elders are so important. A wise elder, like uncle was saying, it, you know, they have to be wise and wise enough to know their position and role. Because that role is to bring, you know, the people that are under them, you know, above, empower them so that they, you know, are able to come up, you know, and live better lives and be able to um, pass on the knowledge to the next generation. That's right. You know, the, uh, the, the problem with power is that power tends to corrupt. And so when people have a taste of power, they don't want to let it go, no matter how old they get. You know, they forget that the responsibility, as is stated here, is uh, it's not for you to be in a position of power as an elder. It is for you to now become responsible for empowering others. Yes. If you want a position just so you, be, you yourself are, is empowered, you're missing the point about uh, who you are or your role as an uh, as a uh, an elder, what it, what you're supposed to be doing? I look at those who are running for pres for the presidency in Nigeria right now. One of them, and I don't like to call names, but one of them is being, you know, I, I was watching a video when one 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 of the uh, candidates couldn't even get up uh, some steps to get onto the podium, you know, to get to the podium. So the the individual was literally lifted up to the podium. And somebody was standing behind him, holding him up. What are you trying? Who are you trying to lead? That is not the position that you, you should have. Now you should be in the position of empowering others and leave the stage for the younger ones, okay, to take that position. And then you advise them, you know. Uh, so it's, it's, it's un unfortunate that a lot of some of the elders don't understand it, you know. Some of the elders still think, hey, you know, I had this power. I've had it for all these years. It tastes good. feels good. I want to stay there. And they forget that that is not their role anymore. It doesn't diminish them. doesn't mean any, they're less than because they don't have that power anymore. They have a different power now. And that is the empowerment, the power to empower. UD, it seems like you want to say something. Yeah, I just want to touch on what you said, touch on what you just said, and a little bit of what uh, Dr. Monet said, you know, all in one uh, swift uh, cut. W what you see in Igbo land, and I'm just going to be specific with Nigeria, really, because I don't really know what goes on in other countries, but I will imagine it's probably about the same thing, you know when you get to the nitty gritty. We practice in Nigeria what we call invented traditions based on a bastardized economic modernity. A lot of the elders that you talk about in Africa or in Nigeria, in Ebola in particular, are not being called elders because of their age and wisdom, but because of their economic you know, placement. Yes. Where they are mm -hmm. economically, you can almost buy the elder title or yeah. be seen in that position <laughs> because of your money, which as yes. far as the culture is concerned, it has nothing to do with your economic uh, standing. That's you right. see, so a lot of these people like uh, 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 Divya, Divya uh, Chidozier mentioned, you know, that put themselves in these prominent positions and then claim to be elders and all. They're only there, not based on they are standing in the community in terms of their level of wisdom, but it's based on their economic position. And because of this bastardized economic modernity, all we value now is money. Yes. We don't have, we don't value yes. the intrinsic, you know, uh, value of the elder system or what being an elder is. And like he mentioned, there are elders and then there are elders. There are elders that are part of the political structure of a village, of a community. Then there are elders that are part of the myomi, myopic structure, the family structure, the intrinsic structure of a community. So you got two schools of elders, both of them equally important. The elders in the political system are usually those people that also are part of the ruling class or the kingship, the aziship, the uh, 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 obese right, that help make political decisions. 
people that the OB will consult or the AZ will consult to make political decisions. So you have those elders that are part of the political structure of the community. Then you have the elders that are just part of the way of life of the community that usually serves the myopic part of the community, which is the families, right? And then uh, 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 Diva Moni also mentioned the idea that, and this is what happens in the villages, at some point, people get so old or get to the point where they can't go to the farm anymore because of their age or whatever. They're taken into their family, not because they're destitute, but because they can help pass wisdom <laughs> to the grandchildren. They can help take care of the grandchildren while the parents are at the farm, farming or doing whatever economic activities that they have to do to be able to sustain the family. So you have that relationship. It has intrinsic value. You have that relationship where not only are the elders the custodian of the culture, but they also pay, play an important role in educating the next generation within the family. Sometimes your grandparents will tell you better stories than your parents can tell you. They will relate things that has to do with your spiritual, economic, or political growth as you mature as a child that your parents will tell you because your parents don't have the level of wisdom that the elders have. Of course, as they get older, you know, the, 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 the level of uh, uh, scholarship that they have will uh, increase. So the point I'm trying to make is a lot of things that you see in uh, Igbo culture, in the Nigerian uh, political system, is really what I call invented traditions, a bastardized economic modernity, Things that are considered Igbo culture now that were not that were, they were that were not Igbo culture before colonization. The way we look at women today is not the way we looked at women before we were colonized by the British. The way we see religion or God, the understanding that Madubuchi bear that you are like God to your fellow human being. The understanding that every human being has the right to worship Chineke the way they understand best without bitterness, without rumpling social harmony. That was the norm. That was part of African culture before foreign religion and came in and then told you that you have to see God a certain way. Only through Jesus Christ are you going to receive salvation. You removed Chineke from you and then hung Chineke up there somewhere where Chineke is now unreachable. Okay, we're going to move on. Thank you so much, Yudi. Uh, absolutely wonderful. Now, we, I want to talk about Jomo Kenyatta, uh, what, what he has, the, the message he has for the youth. And I want you guys to talk about that and keep it brief so that uh, everybody gets a chance to come in there because this is important. He says that to all the dispossessed youth of Africa, if our young people will pay attention, for perpetuation of communion with ancestral spirits through the fight for African freedom and in the firm faith that the dead, the living and the unborn will unite to rebuild the destroyed shrines. What is going on in Africa right now and our young people are being told it's okay. It's okay that uh, the shrines are being destroyed. I think it was in Enugu where they had a big bonfire. I want you guys to think about that. A big bonfire. And they had young people and, uh, you know, little kids and, and elders and young people in the middle. Uh, they had a big event burning the shrines of, of Africa. Burning their own culture, their own spiritual culture. This is what has been done to us in destroying what we have, you're literally destroying the elders as well. You're actually saying to the young people that what the elders taught you is not right. So in fighting for freedom, it is important that our young people understand the dead, the living, and the unborn will unite to rebuild the destroyed shrines because it has to be rebuilt. That is our foundation. This is who we are. And to allow this to continue, and it's still going on, there's so much destruction of African spirituality. And unfortunately, what it's leaving is young people who are devoid of knowledge about who they are. They are very good at promoting 
other people's way of life. And I said it earlier when we started this program, there is nothing really wrong with learning about other people. Take what you will and, and, and leave what you, you, you don't, uh, you can't use, but you don't destroy your own thing. Okay. And that's what's going on. I'm going to add a chair, Josie. I'll have you uh, speak on this. And then we'll uh, go back to you. Right. Uh, it's a uh, it's a pity that uh, it's uh, it's it's happening that way, and yeah. um, I think uh, uh, we really have to do something about this and do it fast because I do know that in some part of Anambra State, they, they have instituted as a group that ensures that they go to the uh, low court, customary uh, court and uh, make sure they obtain uh, legal papers for shrines because when we talk about preservation of artifacts shrines are part of our ancient artifacts because if we destroy them then how do we know about our past and how do we know about what the elders left for us yes. so they, there's this group in anambra state i met them way back about 10 years ago and if you destroy any shrine they sue you to court uh -huh. And I think uh, the, the, the man that led that was a Zikist. He was one of the devotees of Zik, and I think he's dead now. Uh, I don't know how uh, strong that organization is. But in, in my own place, what has happened is that I, here in Lagos, I have managed to convince them about the importance of shrines and how to preserve our ancient spiritual engines because they represent our uh, communal spirit. And they, they represent, as they represent our communal spirit, they are our uh, the legacies of our elders for us. And so now they see uh, with, uh, with what happened when um, uh, Macron came here, Macron did not go to any church. Uh, of all places in Lagos, he, he didn't go to the governor's office. He went to the shrine and the person he went there to greet was Fela, who was no longer there physically, but there spiritually to commune with Fela. And then with Femi and Shem and Femi's uh, uh, children, uh, uh, children. And so uh, uh, that enabled them to see, when I brought that to them, it enabled them to see the importance of why uh, we should preserve our ancient shrines in my village. So I think we need more uh, uh, of what we are doing here, uh, hopefully, when we do get uh, uh, on ground and start, uh, like uh, you have uh, what you have in Mboro, the school you are going to have in Mboro, we need to train as many devious in modern terms as possible. Uh, because I would rather be talking about how we are going to uh, uh, tackle this problem uh, um, because it has serious implications of us eradicating what represents our mind. Yes. our traditional minds that's what we are gradually eradicating because if you really yes. want to deal with the people deal with their mind and one way of dealing with their mind is to eradicate their history hijack their history tell their history to them in your own perspective because history is not just about the past it is about the human memory and like we say a faint memory it's a calamity and a lost memory it's doom it's a bleak future mm. and so mm. we need to preserve our shrines we need to do everything to preserve them and i do hope that uh, the program in Uporo takes off because some of us uh, i do hope that the idea some of us have we do get to put them in place so that such things will be replicated all over not just Igbo land Africa, uh, plus the Chiefs University to come, we have to train as many DBS as possible all over African community to start preserving ancient African shrines. Pela has done his own in a yes. little way by modernizing the shrine and giving it a music coloration, musical coloration. And that is happening all over Southern America, not here in Africa. So something is wrong. And the only yes. way we can tackle it is to ensure that the program that uh, uh, you and uh, UD have kept, that uh, KOK started, and you and UD have taken it to other dimensions, some of us are joining, 
we intensify it, get it on ground, and begin to train people. And that's, uh, I, I love the spirit of uh, Dr. Uh, Mone, uh, you know, because uh, we do need that kind of spirit because she has that passion and a lot of young ones coming on. That's the only way we can tackle this. If not, we just keep crying wolf. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yudi, any comments? Yeah, this is uh, a typical example Example of, uh, um, by the way, kudos to what uh, Dr. Chidozier just said. I concur 100%. Um, yes. This is a typical example of Pan-Africanism, the Pan-African thought process. It's part of it, right? Um, the greatest defense that you, a community has against imperialism is maintenance of your cultural traditions, your religion. All human systems are products of religion, and the shrine is part of this religion of Africa, whether you're Igbo, Cameroonian, Yoruba, uh, Ashanti, Zulu, doesn't really matter. Culture is culture. Um, it's really a tragedy that uh, we don't really have bona fide cultural institutions in all of Africa. I think uh, I, one time I had an argument or I was having a, a, a conversation with somebody about the emancipation of the African mind for Africa to move forward. The mind has to be eman emancipated because people like Jomo Kenyatta that fought for the uh, uh, um, freedoms of Africa, African people, for people of Kenya and so, uh, so on and so forth, they were just not talking about taking the chains off your limbs. They were also talking about taking the chains off your mind to have the mindset that is pan-African, to mold your mind to understand that the strength of the people reside in their religion, their culture. All systems within a community comes from its religion. So when you talk about the shrine, you know, uh, you know the 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 cathedrals and the mosques are all shrines, just made more valuable or. or, 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 or more immense by money but they're all the same thing a shrine is just a place of worship so it's a cathedral and your mosque and what have you they're all the same thing it is money that makes the other ones a little bit more grand but people have personal shrines in their houses they have community shrines so beauty is in the eye of uh, the beholder but the tragedy is that if we don't understand that to sustain or to have an upward trajectory in terms of where Africa is going, if we don't understand that we must preserve our culture, our way of life, our religion, our political systems, synthesize it for the 21st century. It's not everything that we did in the past that is relevant in today's world, but there are things that are absolutely important, as intrinsic as thou shalt not lie. Doesn't mean that people don't lie. Sometimes you find yourself in a situation where you have to lie to save your life. And you're given a choice between spiritually, in your mind, between telling a lie and saving the li your life or the lives of your children or telling the truth and getting killed. Mm -hmm. Self-preservation will say, hey, sometimes there are caveats, there are exceptions. There are exceptions to that shall not kill. But it's a commandment. But there are basic things about human history and culture and traditions in terms of the political evolution of the people that is very important. And it is important that we maintain those things because it allows us to keep the society together and also chart a course for the future. And that way we don't experience the breakup that we see in Africa where almost every part of our culture has been corrupted. The chieftaincies, which is not even part of African, you know, a, 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 a culture, but the political system, social systems, things that we, we were impossible to even think about doing 50 years ago is now the norm. The amber banana can become a chief and nobody bats an eye. Why? Because it's got some money. The elder system has been corrupted. So people like Jomo yes. Kenyatta with that quote, is saying yes. that we have to go back to a pan-African mindset. Okay. For us to build the future, we must pay attention to our spiritual culture. 
because it is yes. through that that we're stronger. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Yudi. Now, I, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going, we're going to have a part two of, uh, uh, of this program next week. So we're going to share more uh, 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 quotes that we're going to discuss. But I want this to be, I want us to talk about this. Then uh, we are going to take a quick break and, uh, and come back and have further discussions. But I, let's just talk about this one. When the missionaries arrived, the Africans had the land and the missionaries had the Bible. They taught us how to pray with our eyes closed. When we opened them, they had the land and we had the Bible. Now we'll go to Dr. Monet. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you, didn't have to, you didn't speak on the other one. We'll start with you here. What are your thoughts on this one? I think that's absolutely true. I think that, you know, the Bible uh, historically for so long was used as a tool uh, for oppression and also for them to steal the land um, in Africa and all, of, you know, in, in the areas that, um, you know, that we built the land. Like in America, you know, most of the African um, that came here built America, you know, unbeknownst to a lot of people, you would never see it. And, and like you said, what did they give us? They gave us the Bible and they told us to, uh, pray with our eyes closed. They got in touching on, uh, the quote prior to that, they took away our shrine. And, and I am a pure example of that because we had no idea what African spirituality is we had no idea how to pray to our ancestors or that we could pray to our ancestors. We were left with nothing. We gave everything. We contribute everything, but was taken. The land was taken from us. And so we have to understand that, you know, come to a realization of what actually happened. And like um, everyone is saying on the panel, it's not that we're saying that you should change your faith if you're Christian or, or whatever belief system that you are. But what we are saying is that you should preserve your original culture. The destroying of, you know, our culture and the taking of our land. As soon as our culture is destroyed, as soon as they, they take down those shrines, then they take our mind. They mm -hmm. take down the shrines and they take our mind and then they take the land and everything else they would like to, to take, our identity, mm -hmm. everything that we know ourselves as African people. And so that our is- names. We we lost our names. We lost yes, our we names. We lost our names. We don't even know mm -hmm. who we are. And so the no. names that we have are, are, you know, in the Bible, that's all we know. We don't know yes. our, our, our native tongue, the tongue of our ancestors. We don't yes. know the God of our ancestors. We don't know Chinake. We don't know Oludamare. Olu we don't know that because those shrines have been taken down. We don't know the power of our ancestors and what our ancestors can do for us. No. And so and now we're destroying ourselves. Yes. We're imploding. Yes. We're imploding, imploding because of that Bible that they gave us. It's yes. not the, the fact that they gave us a Bible, but it's the fact that we have thrown the baby out with the bathwater. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. taken on a whole nother culture. A whole a whole new identity. It's almost yes. like we are two people. Uh, with, uh, you know, how some individuals have different personalities, some of them good, some of them bad, and given the situation, one of them would appear. Uh, this is what we have become, you know, because a lot of these people who have accepted all these foreign religions, when they are with their own people, in some situations, they forget all of those, they come back home. <laughs> ah, they go to the shrine and all of that, you know. But then when they are outside uh, of that community, you know, then they want to be as, as uh, Eurocentric as possible because in the cities and all that sort of thing, that's more acceptable. But when you're in the uh, in the village, then it's uh, to some degree it's acceptable to be African. But you know, uh, but in the cities, you have to you have to uh, 
carry the Bible. You have, and then here's the thing about the Bible and all of that is that you know most of these people who are carrying it in Africa, they don't even read it. They don't know. Some of them can't even read, but they carry it around and they go to church and it's being interpreted for them by the pastor. And the pastor interprets it the way he wants to interpret it. He may not even have anything to do with what the Bible says, you know. <laughs> they just, just, just believe it, you know, because uh, the man of God said, the man of God himself probably did not read anything, maybe a couple of lines and he added his own words. And here you are, the man of God said, you know. Now let me ask uh, uh, Divya and then we'll go to Yudi. And then we'll, we'll move on to other conversations. All right, go on, Divya. Here does it. Uh, yeah, you see, what is the quote here is a deliberate uh, uh, policy by the colonialist. Mm -hmm. Here is a speech here. This speech was a speech delivered by King Leopold II to mm -hmm. the missionaries that yes. were uh, Belgian missionaries that were going on their mission to the Congo. Yes. This speech was the source of this speech. Uh, is uh, is uh, Mr. Makon Mokwani Makuni uh, Bukoku exposed this speech to the world. He was born in the Congo in 1915. While working in Congo in 1935, he bought a second-hand Bible previously owned by a Belgian priest. The priest forget forgot the text of the king's speech in the Bible. And the beginning of the speech, this is what the beginning of the speech says, Reverend, Father, dear compatriot, the task that you uh, that is given to you to fulfill is very delicate and requires much tact. You will certainly evangelize, but your evangelization must inspire above all Belgian interests. Your principal objective in our mission in the Congo is never to teach the meager to know God. These they know already. They speak and submit to a Munga, one Zambi, one Zakumba, and what else I don't know. They will know that to kill, to sleep with someone else's wife and so on and so forth is sin. So the mission, it was a mission given distract them from the focus because our ontology our cosmology our spirituality our cosmogony focuses on the earth and beneath the earth that's where our ancestors live yes. and then the mission was one two one uh, was basically two one destroy their religious system yes. make them believe that they have shrines and amulets and charms are evil. Two, distract. Uh, why should you destroy the shrines and the amulets? It gives us confidence to fight. Because when you go into a shrine and you have, wear an amulet, your psychology is boosted. Psychological booster. Then he said, when you destroy their shrines and distract them from the amulet, make them believe it is bad. It's a program by the church and the mosque and the education system from kindergarten to university. That's the plan. Then when you've done that, do as much as you can using the Bible to distract them from the plenty beneath their ground. And what do you do that? Place their hopes in the sky. Yeah. Use the Bible to promote poverty in their mentality, like happy are the poor, for they shall see God. It is difficult for the rich to enter heaven and easier for the camel to pass through the eye of the needle. Yes. So it's a deliberate policy by all colonial masters, and they are perpetuating that today through the schools, through the churches, through the uh, uh, mosques, through organizations like AMOC uh, and Kanka, all foreign secret societies, Sea Dog, and so on and so forth, they are all meant to make us look Europe world.
We can't that was, hear you. That's, wonder, that's oh, wonderful. Okay. You hit it on the head. Yes. Yes. And uh, I, I, I just want a brief comment from you, Yudi, because we need to move on to some final thoughts that. Uh, yeah, he, uh, he put it in a, uh, Dr. Chidas, he put it in a nutshell. He pretty much exposed the intent. Uh, one distinction I wanted to make. The statement up on the screen, when the missionaries arrived, the Africans had the land and the missionaries had the Bible. They taught us how to pray with our eyes closed. When we opened them, they had the land and we had the Bible. This happened in two ways or in two, two different periods of time. The initial period of time, nobody taught us the Bible. They forced it on us. If you saw the movie Roots, where Kunta Kinte insisted that his name is Kunta Kinte, they told him your name is Toby. They started to, I mean, bestow some violence on upon this guy until he agreed to change his they name. They broke him. They broke him. They broke him from Toby. I mean, uh, from Kunta Kinte to Toby. Mm -hmm. They broke us with violence. Yes. Nobody came with the Bible and said, hey, listen, here's Adam and Eve, and here's uh, Moses, Abraham, uh, would you like to listen to what we have to say? Do you like what we preach to you? If you like it, it would be nice for you to accept Jesus Christ. Nobody came to you with that. No, they came with a gun and the sword. Yes. Mm. They put it down on you till you change your name from mm. Tukwe Mecca to Sunday, from mm -hmm. Kunta Kinte to Toby. That was the first phase. Then the second phase, as uh, Dr. Chido had mentioned, was to establish their institutions mm -hmm. to convince you that your way of life is bad and theirs is better. But before they could do that, before they could uh, 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 imbue that on you, they had to break you for you to listen. Everything that happened to Africa happened through the policy of blood and iron. And that's why today yes. it's really very difficult because of all the time that has gone by. Some of our ancestors, like Anhai and Zik, that tried to emancipate our minds, the Kwame Nkrumahs, by the time they got through trying to get to us, it was almost already too late. And what you see now is the gradual disappearance of African culture, the destruction of African culture, the church using African agents to do their work. The European is not in Africa burning the, the, the shrines. They're not no. in Africa destroying it's anything. We're not yes. doing the job for them That's because we suffer from what we call Stockholm Syndrome. Yes. 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 That's the right. person that took you prisoner that went into the bank to rob the bank and took the bank, uh, the bank workers hostage, called the police to deliver some food to the people being held hostage. And when the people yes. were released, and they asked them, what do you think about the person that held you hostage? They said, well, he may have held us hostage, but it was nice to us. Yes. That's what's happening yes. to Africa right now. Yes, yes, so yes, yes. With you. the institutions destroyed, with the educational system destroyed, when you go to school and nobody's in, uh, 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 enforcing or reinforcing African culture in your mind, they tell you about Jesus in your house. You go to school, they're telling you the same thing. On Sunday, they tell you the same thing. It's a cycle. You have nowhere to go. Your mind is now jacked up morning, mm -hmm. afternoon, night. No matter where you go, Jesus or Muhammad is in the brain. So I, and I, no, I'm saying hopefully we get to a point through the effort that we're making right now through, you know, having people like uh, Dr. Simona and uh, 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 Dr. Chidozie and all the other great Africanists out there with a part of African mindset to join us, join this kind of effort, not just join the Global Fit Ministry of Chism, but join organizations that are genuinely trying to bring us back to the fold so that we could pay attention to African culture, African spirituality, our religion, our way of life, our history, understanding that this is the only way to build a better Africa and it is the only way to engage imperialism. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much. You know, uh, one of the things that uh, I have come to realize is that uh, 
many people have different religions, but there's something that brings us together. When we, it, when we personally believe that our role is not to ask Chineke for anything, but our role is to give to people on behalf of Chineke, we forget our religion. We start working together. We put aside all of that. Um, one of the things that I am very proud of as a chiefist is that what motivates me in life is not money. I've had money. I commanded a lot of money. And I found that my happiness did not, it didn't give me all that happiness. I mean, it certainly did it took care of a whole lot of things. But what gives me the most happiness is the very thing that we as chiefs believe, Madubuchibea or Akomdere uh, Opani, my wealth lies outside of me. That is what my spirituality teaches me. It doesn't say that I should starve to death. That's not the point. But it also reminds me, Akomdere Opani, as you grow, so you should pull somebody else with you. Because if you're rich, and, and I'm not saying that I am, but if you're rich and you bring some people to a certain level of sustenance, okay, that they can take care of themselves and become constructive members of society, then you, your community is better, not because of just you, but because of all the people that have been taken out of the valley and are rising to the mountaintop. That is what makes me happy. That is my joy. When I say I'm a cheers, that's what it is to me. Who have I helped? Who is better off today because of me, because of what I've done? Now, you know, we talked to you guys about uh, one of the programs and of course, African Women Mobilization Commission, we are all in integrated. One of the uh, child support uh, program that we're doing, I shared with you last time, the beginning of a, a, a workshop, I mean, uh, 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 the, the child, uh, uh, Ahmed Abdullahi that we had uh, taken out of the uh, IDPS camp and we had cleaned him up, we got food for him, got him new clothing. But I just want to share a video as an update to show what, because we care, what has become of this child. And not only that, I just want to thank Yudi, Dr. Monet, uh, Akachi, you, uh, Onamdi, all those people that I contribute, Dr. Nubantu, uh, Ankawanda, uh, Kuwasi, um, all, all, the, all those individuals that have come together and said, okay, fine, let's make this happen. We have also picked up another girl. Next next week, hopefully, I'll show you the, uh, we picked up a little girl. I'll show you the, two little girls, actually, I'll show you the video. But let me share with you what has happened to Ahmed Abdullahi, uh, based on your effort and your kindness. So let me share the video. Thank you so much. Uh, my queen, this is Ahmed. Ahmed uh, is looking good this morning. We're here in Ahmed's house. We're taking him to, to the school. Uh, uh, we'll go and enroll him into a school. And we'll keep you posted in all that we do. Ahmed Kache, good morning. Uh, uh, I'm ready to say good morning to you. Uh, uh, we shall soon be on our uh, way to the school to enroll Ahmed. Thank you. Um, uh, we are on our way to Ahmed School. Uh, this is Ahmed. This is Ahmed. Uh, we are on our way to his school. And this is our executive board member. Good morning, my queen. How are you? You and the family. I hope everybody is doing. We are on the way to Ahmed School. We are going to enroll him today into school. Thank you, Ma. Yes. I will, will keep you posted on what we did in school. Thank you. <laughs> mm. 
No, acha. No. This is the principal of this school, and this is Ahmed. Uh, they were uh, uh, text was given to Ahmed. Ahmed was asked to write a, his name or write A B C D uh, for the principal to know which class Ahmed will be fit in. Brought Ahmed to tell her to saw his uniform. Ahmed is being measured, and tomorrow will be the first day of Ahmed in school. Uh, this is his uniform. We bought his uniform. This is the tailor that is measuring Ahmed. Uh, this is Ahmed. Uh, his first day in school. His first day in school. We are taking him to school. Can you call him? Yes. Yes. This is Ahmed. Ahmed. Uh, we are taking him to school. As you can see his uniform. Uh huh. I made it be taken.
<laughs> we deserve oh, so beautiful. I mean, they went through all kinds of pain to, you know, uh, Ahmed's books and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah. <laughs> that was really cute. I put all yeah. that you know, the thing is, I, I do apologize for some of the uh, static uh, nature of the video. It, I couldn't put, I couldn't play it. It was too too much for uh, the stream yard to play directly. So I had to put it in a different for, for, format for it to be played. So but that information is going to be on Chism uh, website as well and uh, OMSI and everywhere. So now the next one is this, these two little girls. I mean, just the, the, how we, I mean, this is what I mean. Be about it. Don't talk about being a, 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 I'm, a I'm a Christian, I'm a Muslim or whatever. Be about it. Show, show us your spirituality. Don't tell me about it. I can show you what I'm doing. I can show yes. you what we're doing. I can show you where Chineke is working through me to change somebody's life. This is a child who was in the valley. In the valley, no hope. No way. There's no way. This child was going to be anything. And we have pulled him up so that this child is going to go to school. 
school. It's going yeah. to achieve. It's going to be somebody. And he's telling his parents, when I become someone, I'm going to do this for you. He's even dream of, dreaming of being president. Come mm -hmm. on. This is what it's about. Lifting our own people up. And the, only, the other thing is, as a cheers, we, we cannot focus on tribalism. This is Eurocentrism. We were not yeah. tribalistic. We moved from one area to the other. We were brothers and sisters. We were not Yoruba, Hausa, ethic, blah, 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 South African, Ugandan. You give we help to those African. that are willing to receive it. Yes. You give you, help you to those what I'm that saying. are willing to receive so, it. That's it. Yeah. So, uh, 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 was saying that we must build true. This is how we build by showing, by doing. You can yeah. only show by example. You lead by example. You can't talk yes, about yes. it. And that's why we want to show the difference between us. I'm not saying there are no religions doing other things, but you always have to ask the motive. What is the motive of doing something? If your motive for Africa is so that they will become members of your religion, that's wrong. I am, what we're doing, these people are not Christian. I mean, they are not Chiefs. They're Muslim, and some of them are Christian. We don't care because cheers don't care about stuff like that. It's humanity. Are we yes. helping humanity? Not your tribe, not your religion. I have individuals who say, oh, well, what about Igbo people? You're an Igbo woman. I say, yeah, I'm an Igbo woman, but I'm also Nigerian. Those people are Nigerian. They're my people. Yes. Well, if the evil people are willing to do what it takes to put those little children in the same position as the boy up north, it's an unfair game. It's a question of, are you, are you willing to forget that I'm a chaste and let me help you? Because evil people always say, oh, they're the devil people. And then because of that, they need the help. They refuse to accept the help because they think I'm devil worshiper instead of just a traditionalist proud of who i am these, so these, these people that we're working with these people that we're working with they see what i see they see what with dr monet sees they see what yes. we are all seeing and this, we are one on the right where i am Chineke is we are one that's what we preach here every day and if yeah. more and more of us if more and more of us will stop putting tribalism uh race and all that in the picture and, and do religion. more of yes of lifting you know stop being religious and be spiritual okay so what we are arguing here is not that we are any better than any re religion that is not what we're arguing here we're arguing that we're good enough right where i am chineke the the, the evil name for holy spirit with a different name in different tongues right where i am chineke is and what does that mean that right where i am chineke is you know, that means that if I want to honor Chineke, I have to honor my fellow human being because Chineke uh, the, uh, is in them as well. From me to Chineke, there is no distance. That means yeah. Chineke is what everything I do. Whatever I'm doing, I Chineke is seeing, am I a good representation of, of, of a K? Am I a good representation of Chi? What aspect mm -hmm. of Chineke am I exemplifying to, up, to uphold and honor the divine? Am I doing that? I, I must be the cause and the reason for, for my own growth and the growth of others if I can help it. It is my responsibility. It is our responsibility. That is what we teach. Yes. Uh, blame no other for our shortcomings. Uh, all that we become is uh, through our hard work. Don't claim exclusive truth in matters of religious worship. Simply claim that the way of my ancestors were not evil, and I'm responsible for building them up and keeping them up. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of this program. My battery is dying. I don't want us to be caught up in my head. So I want to thank all of you for joining us, wherever you joined us from. DBS, thank you so much for all that you've done today. <laughs> my battery. <laughs> To, uh, to plug it in it's about to die of me so thank you thank you thank you we'll thank see you, you. see you later see you next week, see you next week. Bye. Bye.